apocalyptic landscapes, nightmarish scenes of war and cruelty, faces of despair and malevolence. These are the paintings and artwork of an incredibly rare sort, a type of art that is brutally heartbreaking and provides art with arguably one of the most tangible insights into human suffering during the horrors of the Second World War. These are the paintings of the German-Jewish surreal artist Felix Nussbaum, who during the midst of the Second World War would tragically fall victim to one of humanity's darkest errors in history and capture his suffering on canvas. What is now known as the Holocaust, a mass genocide of millions of innocent Jewish Europeans carried out by Nazi Germany, is something that still bitterly haunts the minds of many people even to this day. There is just something particularly palpable about witnessing the horrors that these people experienced through the art of paint that truly delivers the essence of one person living amongst suffering victims of such an event. His surreal style of painting heightens specific feelings and perspectives of the concentration camps through metaphoric imagery, exaggerated features, and warped perspectives, as if storytelling from a perspective of a dream or a nightmare. The fate of Felix Nussbaum and his family consists of the desperate efforts to find shelter and refuge on foreign soil. A terribly sad story of the history of one family among many that found itself in the middle of a hopeless and doomed situation, eventually entering Auschwitz, and sadly neither him or any of his family would ever leave alive. These paintings not only tell his story, but from a certain perspective, the story of many other victims of the Holocaust, and what it was like to experience such horrific torture and violence by Nazi Germany. This is the story and artwork of Felix Nussbaum. Felix Nussbaum was born on December 11, 1904, in Osnabrück in Germany. His father, Philip Nussbaum, was a World War I veteran and German patriot before the rise of the Nazis. He was also an aspiring painter in his youth, but due to financial reasons, Philip's art endeavours would eventually dwindle in pursuit of other jobs to provide a steadier income. That would not hinder his passion and interest for art, however, especially after his son Felix was born, as it's documented that Philip eagerly encouraged Felix during his childhood to pursue art as well and home in on his talents. As Felix grew older, Philip was still a well-respected World War I veteran and proud German patriot. That is, until a sleeping giant, a new regime that was close to seizing power over the country and parts of Europe, would force him to surrender his membership in the veteran organisation he was a member of. In his parting remarks, he made the following statement. For the last time, dear comrades in arms, I salute you as a loyal soldier, and if I am again called to the flag, I am ready and willing. During this time, Felix was a student in Rome, in an institution part of the Berlin Academy of the Arts, eventually gaining an impressive and lucrative scholarship. However, by January in 1933, the Nazi regime had taken its very first steps towards seizing power, and Adolf Hitler was now appointed as the German Chancellor. Barely a few months later, Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, would even visit the artistic elite and lectured them on the Führer's artistic doctrine as follows. The Aryan race and heroism are the main themes that the Nazi artist is to develop. After Felix Nussbaum learned of this, he began to believe, much to his dismay, that there was no place for him as an artist or a Jew within the confines of this new rising fascist doctrine. He was forced to leave Rome by early May that same year, and his scholarship was revoked a short time later. Sadly though, this would only be the beginning of Felix's troubles from here onwards. In this crude yet powerful work of his, titled The Great Disaster, created in 1939, Felix heavily expresses his state of mind in the minds of other Jewish communities during this rise of fascism in Europe. In the background, we can see ruined buildings against a haunting, night-like sky. 
with both the sun and moon apparently illuminating the apocalyptic world below. Many bodies of the dead and suffering can be seen scattered everywhere, in and amongst the rubble and ruins. In the foreground, we can see the three figures crawling helplessly on the floor. The woman in front is completely naked, with the woman behind her looking as if she's pleading towards the heavens. In the left foreground, I find these two figures particularly interesting. The one in front has large eyes that look almost as if he is crying black tears, and is covering his mouth. The figure behind looks more feminine in appearance, has her hand on her forehead, in an expression of shock or disbelief in what she is witnessing. Everything about this piece, despite how different it appears in stark contrast to his usual style, is just so gripping in its execution. Its simplified technique almost adds more to the message that he is conveying, as it's apparent the focus of his work was to unleash his fears, his frustrations, and his sense of foreboding that the outbreak of a war means the destruction of European culture. A year after Felix's scholarship was revoked, his father and his mother Rachel left their hometown of Osnabluk along with other Jewish inhabitants, leaving Felix in the care of his older brother, Justus, as they would make their way to Switzerland. Felix would meet his parents again in a small town on the Italian Riviera. During this period, it's said that he was at his happiest during the summer that he spent with his family, as well as his companion and future wife, Felke Playtek. This is possibly indicated by a lot of the bright and vibrant colours that he would use in his paintings during this time, such as this tranquil painting of his, of an Italian harbour surrounded by cypress trees produced that very year, called the beach at Rapallo. This happy period would prove to have a tragic bitter taste however, as this would be the last time Felix would see his parents again, who would later give in to their homesick feelings for their homeland of Germany and after returning there, were eventually deported to Auschwitz and murdered. Despite his parents' eager urge to return to Germany, Felix would object to this profusely, a rare trait for him in spite of his unfaltering respect for his parents. As his parents returned to Germany, he and Felke remained away, first travelling to Paris in January 1935, and then to the Belgian resort town of Ostend, it would be several months later when Felix and Felker would settle in Brussels and then marry in 1937. Sadly, during this year, Felix's brother Justus was forced to emigrate the Nussbaum family's hometown of Osnabrück when all Jewish businesses in the area were Aryanized. Justus would flee with his wife and infant daughter to the Netherlands where he, along with other forced migrants, managed to start up a scrap metal company. Back in Osnabrück, where Felix's parents were still residing, the situation was rapidly going from bad to worse. Synagogues were burned to the ground, Jewish homes were looted, and all Jewish men were taken to Dachau, a concentration camp based in southern Germany. In May 1939, Felix's parents decided once again to leave Germany, fleeing this time to Amsterdam to reunite with justice. The sanctuary of Belgium and the Netherlands would only be brief, however, as by May 1940, both countries were soon occupied by Nazi Germany. Felix was eventually found and arrested in his apartment, and sent along with other emigrants to the Saint Cyprian camp in southern France. It would be during this time that Felix would sense the terrifying reality of what the world around him had truly become. This sense of doom would be reflected in this nightmarish painting of his called The Camp Synagogue, produced in 1940 and completed the following year. This painting again presents us with a dark apocalyptic landscape and atmosphere. Grey and black sky in the background, along with a flock of ravens or crows. Featured also are five people cloaked in prayer shawls, entering a crude shack that serves as a makeshift synagogue. This makeshift place of prayer was an actual construction completed by the Jewish captives within the concentration camp of St. Cyprian, where Felix was held captive. The cloaked man that we can see standing alone, some experts believe to be Felix himself, who was ambivalent about his Jewish identity, like many other young men of his age at this time. What I find particularly interesting is the very specific objects Felix has chosen to half submerge into the ground that we can see in the forefront of the painting. We can see a singular shoe, some barbed wire, an empty tin can, and a bone. 
All these objects could be symbolic in just how cruel the conditions of a camp were. The lost shoe could indicate the lack of appropriate clothing that the captives were provided. The empty tin can could be symbolic of a lack of fresh food and water. The barbed wire indicating the hopelessness of escape. And finally the bone, almost going without saying, symbolizing death. Felix would in fact manage to escape, however, and would complete this painting in Brussels after he had started the rough drawing within the camp itself. Returning us again to the isolated figure cloaked in the prayer shawl on the right, should this actually be Felix Nussbaum, this could be an incredibly moving representation of his acceptance and pride of his Jewish heritage, despite his apparent ambivalence. During what was once considered to be such a harrowing period of doom and despair, Felix would only feel a closer sense of belonging to the Jewish people and his Jewish roots. Another painting that could symbolise this could be his more well-known painting titled Self-Portrait with Jewish Identity Card, completed in 1943, the year before he was sent to Auschwitz, in which Felix is looking directly at the viewer, revealing the Star of David behind the lapel of his coat, and in his other hand, holding the Jewish Identity Card, again facing towards the viewer. This could indicate a sense of Jewish solidarity and pride for his faith amongst the chaos. Or it could, as others have theorised, be more a representation of persecution and degradation imposed upon Jews by the Nazis. Whatever its true meaning, this heartbreaking expression of alertness and fear in Felix's eyes is unbelievably striking, and regularly features in many more of his self-portraits during this period. After three gruelling months in the camp and eventually escaping, Felix was once again on the run. He made his way back to Brussels to be reunited with his wife. Felix and his wife Felke were now living a life of hiding, with virtually no source of income. Felix would have close friends in Belgium, however, who would provide him and his wife with supplies, food and clothes, and would even provide Felix with art supplies and a studio space. This unfortunately could not last though, as Felix lacked any legal documentation or residency papers, and was constantly at risk of one day being discovered by Nazi troops. Felix would continue to be constantly on the move, avoiding resting in any one place for too long, yet simultaneously perfecting his artistic craft and producing his paintings. On the horizon, however, the fate of him and his family was about to be sealed completely. By August 1943, the protection given to the employees of Justice Nussbaum's scrap metal business was revoked. He, his wife, their daughter Marianne, and the Nussbaum parents were arrested in their hideout apartments and sent to the Westerbork Transit Camp based in the Northeast Netherlands, a camp that was essentially a staging facility for Jewish captives before being sent to the concentration camps. And eventually, the long torturous journey to their end began for Felix's parents, Philip and Rachel, in February 1944, when they were deported from Westerbork to the extermination camp of Auschwitz. That same year, in July, Felix and his wife Felke were apprehended in their hideout at the time and sent to a camp in Mechelen. Later that month, they were deported to Auschwitz where Felix was murdered on the 9th of August, 1944. His older brother Justus would follow their parents to Auschwitz from Westerbork the following month in September. Three days later, Herta, Justus's wife and Felix's sister-in-law, as well as Mary Ann, the only daughter of Justus and niece to Felix, were also murdered at Auschwitz. Finally in October, Justus, the last surviving member of the Nussbaum family at the time, was sent to the Stutthof camp, where he would eventually die of exhaustion some two months later. This painting, named Triumph of Death, was completed by Felix Nussbaum in 1944, just four months before he was murdered by the Nazis in Auschwitz. During the time Felix painted this, he already knew that he and his family were doomed, and every sense of that morbid hopelessness can be witnessed in this work quite significantly. Represented once again by an apocalyptic backdrop of debris, ruins and destruction, with a family of skeletal beings dancing on the ruins, playing musical instruments. 
In the sky can be seen the disturbing faces of kites floating in the wind. The haunting stares and expressions of these kites feel almost as if they're demonic entities scanning the ground below for any victims that may cross their path. The various broken objects that we see on the ground, in and amongst the debris, are a collection of some things from Felix's everyday life, such as his wife's tailor dummy or his father's car. The withering organ player that we can see near the centre, some have theorised to be Felix himself, as he bears some of his features that also appear in his other painting from the previous year called The Organ Grinder, a painting believed to be an alter ego of Felix. With this in mind, the painting that we see here of a family of skeletons dancing and performing atop a pile of broken treasures of the Nussbaums, with supposedly Felix himself amongst them, leaves such a powerful indicator into what this painting and the title of a painting could possibly represent. Felix Nussbaum and his family fell victim to the cruelest people that the world had ever seen during a time when the war had claimed so many innocent lives for so long. It must have truly felt like the end of the world to so many people. It is little wonder that Felix's later artwork would encapsulate so many apocalyptic themes with such little hope. Thankfully, though his life was tragically taken from him, his art survived as well as his thoughts and commentary on what these innocent people endured. Everything about Felix Nussbaum's art is at its purest and most honest, hiding nothing from the comforted, the undisturbed and the unsuspecting viewers to ensure that they are left feeling quite the opposite, in hopes to truly express how it felt to live such a terrifying existence. This gripping legacy that he's left behind still echoes in people's hearts to this day. By the 1980s, the hometown of Felix Nussbaum, Usnabluk, would embrace and celebrate him as a local hero and native son eventually opening a local gallery in 1998 entirely dedicated to him called the Felix Nussbaum House, where most of his paintings now currently reside. There is also dedicated exhibitions here that focus on intolerance and racism. Thank you so much for watching this video. Felix Nussbaum and his artwork was recommended to me by one of my viewers in an email. Thank you so much for all your suggestions. I really appreciate the fact that the content on this channel can become a collaborative effort and that we can all share ideas like this. The story was particularly sad for me to research, but I hope that it's been educational and I hope that it's inspired some of you to check out more of his incredibly powerful paintings, especially the ones that I didn't get a chance to talk about. Before I go, as always, I would like to present the segment of my videos called Artist Corner, where I get to present some art sent in by one of my viewers. Today's independent artist I would like to share with you today is another surreal artist from Sweden named Gustav Hedin. Experiencing horrific nightmares since he was a child, these dreams would leave a significant, lifelong impact on Gustav. From the age of 16, he's experienced these nightmares on a more regular basis, sometimes up to four or five times a week, with sleep deprivation often leaving him questioning if he's asleep or awake. Forcing himself to drop out of school due to depression and anxiety, Gustav pursued an escape and purpose through painting. From his experience of going through countless horrifying dreams, Gustav was able to express his inner thoughts and visions through the paintings we see here now. Painting has been a true saving grace for Gustav, helping him in many ways to have better control over his nightmares and how to deal with them when they next creep up on him. I think it's amazing how intimate the view into his head is through the paintings that he creates. As he says, a lot of his thoughts cannot be described in just words, so in a very real sense, these paintings are the clearest picture into what Gustav has experienced and how he sees the world. The fact that these paintings are a therapeutic outlet for him makes his art even more powerful to me. If you'd like to see more from Gustav, please follow the links that you see here and in the description below and show him some much deserved support. If you'd also like to feature in my Artist Corner segment, please send me an email to blinddweller at gmail.com with examples of your art and a bit about yourself for a chance to feature in one of my videos. I've also recently started to use Twitter, so feel free to contact me on there as well if you like. That's all for me today, thank you for watching, and thank you to my top tier channel members this month, Garrett Greathouse, Ken B, and Carol Hartong. Your donations are much appreciated and help keep these videos coming. See you in the next video soon. Bye for now.